This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream, home to thousands of documentaries and nonfiction titles for curious minds. Okay, here we go. So this is a continuation of the last video I made where I talked about going through a real analysis textbook, or real analysis is this upper level uh, pure math class. And here I wanted to go through one of the proofs from the book, just show you guys what a proof from a math class like this kind of looks like. And I like this example we're gonna do because pretty much anyone watching should be able to follow it. It could be an algebra two and you should be totally fine with this. Uh, so what we're gonna prove is something called the bolzano weierstrass theorem, which I hope I'm pronouncing somewhat sort of correctly. Okay, here we go. What we have here is a sequence. I picked specific numbers, uh, but it's an infinite sequence. Starts at negative seven, negative four, six, there's pi in here, negative 2.5. It could be any real numbers we want for the most part. I ended with a pattern, eight, negative eight, eight, negative eight, forever, uh, which I did not have to do. It could have just been any real numbers. But the sequence has to be bounded, okay? Our sequence is bounded between negative 10 and 10, inclusive. All these numbers lie in this interval, including the endpoints, nothing outside of it. So other than that, you can pick any real numbers you want, so long as they lie in your bounds. Okay, and that is definitely the case here. So infinite sequence, and then I drew this interval just for the visual. So like the first term is negative seven, and that's here, a1 is negative seven, and then negative four is the next term, so a2 is negative four, and so on. You'll notice that eight is the 14th term, and the 16th, and the 18th, and so on forever, infinite terms. Same with negative eight, that's the 15th term, 17th, and so on forever. All right, so we have infinite sequence, here's the visuals, and then what I'm gonna do down here is make a subsequence. And a subsequence is exactly what it sounds like. It is a sequence, also an infinite sequence, only made up by picking numbers from this one. Okay, we just can pick and choose whatever we want, but it has to be from these, okay? So I'll skip the first two, I'll pick six, that's the first term, all right? And then let's pick 10 as the next one. And I'll skip a bunch, I'll pick nine. And then I'll pick eight. And I'll pick the next eight. And I'll, actually I'll pick only eights from here on. So we pick only eights forever. And now we have a subsequence, an infinite sequence only made up of numbers from here. And by the way, for a subsequence, no, you can't just pick 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, just throw that in here. You use this one, a 10, then you have to move on. You, the next one in this term has to be something that comes later. Okay, so you can't just start, or you can't just go backwards or anything like that. You can't grab this eight and then grab the seven and then you can't do that. Okay, so it's just gotta go in order. But otherwise, we're good. So we got our subsequence. Now notice that our original sequence does not converge, right? It, eight, negative eight, eight, negative eight, forever. It does not approach any number. This doesn't equal a number forever, nothing like that. However, our subsequence does converge. It's 888 forever. In real analysis, you learn rigorously what it means for a sequence to converge, but just realize if you have the same number forever that the sequence converges to that. This will be more of a high level proof. I'm not gonna be writing, writing it out or doing any of the rigorous stuff from real analysis, but it's still, still good enough to show you what a proof looks like. Okay, now here's what we have to do. Here's the proof. The question is, Prove that any bounded sequence has a subsequence that converges. That's it. That's all we gotta do. Prove this is always possible. Give me a sequence bounded between two numbers, whatever they may be, and there's always a way to pick certain numbers such that they go on forever, but they converge. That's all we gotta do. Now, in my opinion, that's an easy to understand question, but it's a hard question to prove. How do you even start? Because I mean, it's so general, it's so generalized. It could be any bounds. It could have been bounded between negative a billion and a billion, and then the numbers are all random. Pi to the eighth is the first term, and then negative 47.6, and then 524, and so on. And I have an uncountably infinite number of 
numbers to choose from. The decimal places could go on as far as I want or forever. Irrationals are fine. How do you how do you prove no matter what, even if there's no pattern like we have here, that I can always pick numbers, certain numbers, forever in a way that those converge? That's not obvious, at least not to me. All right, so yeah, if you want to try it on your own, think about it. Now is time to pause the video. Otherwise, I'm just going to get into it. Now, because this is bounded and I can draw a finite interval like this, I can split that interval up into two halves from negative 10 to 0 and 0 to 10. And I'll call those halves i1 and i1 prime. So i one from negative 10 to 0 inclusive, including negative 10, 0. And then i1 prime is 0 to 10, also inclusive. And the prime is not derivative prime, just another representation. Okay, so 0 is included in both of these, which is not a big deal. Because this sequence had infinitely many terms, we know one of these intervals must contain infinitely many terms as well. At least one of them. It could be both of them. In this case, it is. But if they were both finite, if there were 10 terms in here and 20 terms in here, then there's 30 terms in total at, in, at the max. And that contradicts the fact that I said there are infinitely many terms. So one of these has to be infinite for sure. In this case, it's both. It, all the eights lie in i1 prime and the infinite number of negative eights lie in i1. Okay, so you pick the one that's infinite. In this case, I can choose which one. So I'm gonna pick i1 prime. From the one you pick, choose a term from there, not any number, just one of your terms. And I'll pick, I'll pick the one we started with here. Six is in there? Yes, six is in there. So I'm picking six, it's the third term. Good to go. Now just repeat what we did with i1 prime. Split that up into two halves from zero to five, five to 10. That will be zero to five will be i2 and five to 10 will be i2 prime. Again, for the same reason as before, one of these must contain infinitely many terms. Because there were infinitely many terms in here, cut that in half, one of these has two as well. In this case, it's just i2 prime. All the eights lie in here. So we have to pick that one. i2 just has one, two, three, four terms. So we're gonna pick i2 prime and then pick a number in here. I'll pick the 10, so that term, which comes after six, right? So we're building our subsequence here. We have the second term of our subsequence. I'm just making it matches. I don't have to, this is just random. And then we repeat. I'll do this only one more time after this. But split i2 prime into two halves. Call that i3 and i3 prime. One of those must contain infinitely many terms. In this case, it's i3 prime. That's where all the eights are. Pick a number from there, nine is in there, it's there, it comes after the 10, so we're good. Third term in our subsequence. And then do that again, split that up into I4 and I4 prime. In this case, the I4 has infinitely many terms, that's where all the eights are. You pick one from there and I'll pick eights. I could have been picking eights this whole time. It really doesn't matter. Uh, and then this continues forever. So think about what that means. I can keep making these nested intervals that are getting smaller and smaller, but every single time they contain infinitely many terms. So as I go, as I keep picking a number from there, putting in there, picking a number, picking a number, picking a number, I have infinitely many to choose from, so I'll always have options throw it in there, those numbers I'm picking are getting infinitely close to one another, forever. So as they get infinitely close, that means they must approach something. In this case, it's eight, but guaranteed they must approach something. And we're done the proof. Again, I haven't rigorously defined like what it means for something to converge, but that's the idea. And I know I did this for a specific sequence, which is not the best idea in math, but this works in general. If I have a bounded sequence, then it must, all the numbers exist between some negative m and m, whether it be negative a billion and a billion or negative two and two. They're all in some interval. I can split that interval into two halves. One of those halves contains infinitely many terms. 
pick that interval and pick a term from there, throw it in your subsequence, and that's the beginning of it. Split that interval now into two halves, again. Pick the interval that has infinitely many terms, and then pick one of those terms, put in your subsequence, do it again, pick a term, do it again, pick a term, do it again, and those terms I am picking are just getting infinitely close to one another. They are just getting closer and closer. The difference between them is approaching zero, which means it's a Cauchy sequence, that's something you learn in real analysis, but in general, that means that this sequence converges to something. Whatever these are getting closer to, and you're done. That completes the proof. Okay? Now, notice that didn't involve any crazy equations or high-level math, really. It just involved creative thinking. You had, to, you had to be a little clever there. And that's what I liked about this class. You had to kind of think outside the box. Try things you haven't tried before. And it's not like this section was the section where every practice problem involves making an interval, cutting it in half, doing that again, and then continuing that, and then you see that it converges and you're done. That's not what this was about. You do learn about nested intervals, actually. This is a topic, but it's not like this is the answer to everything, not even close. Unlike in calculus where, you know, oh, this is the section where we learn chain rule, and that's what you're doing for every problem. And this is the section where you do U substitution, so that's what you're doing for every problem. You know what's coming. It's not totally like that in this class. Not, not as much, not even close, honestly. Because, again, you just have to try some things you might not have seen. Try some little tricks. Uh, think outside the box. You just don't know exactly uh, what to do for each problem in terms of, oh, I'm going to be using this formula. It's not like that at all. But yeah, that's the idea behind the proof. And there's another proof to this. My, the textbook I went through didn't go through it, but there are other ways. I like this one because it was very visual. And hopefully that shows you guys what uh, one of these proofs looks like. But yeah, I think that's all I wanted to show. And then before we go, I also want to thank CuriosityStream for sponsoring this video. Now, like I said in the last video, I'm still a huge fan of applied math. So again, I want to advertise one of my favorite documentaries on this site, which is Codebreaker. This is the story of how mathematics and cryptography were used to help put an end to the Second World War. However, this goes beyond Alan Turing, whose name is the most famous when it comes to this subject. This video goes through the story of a mathematician named Bill Tutt and an engineer named Tommy Flowers, and what they were amazingly able to do in the field of cryptography and the effect they had on the war. Plus, it goes through some of the actual mathematics that was used to decipher German communications. So this is definitely one I recommend. CuriosityStream is available on a variety of platforms worldwide, and if you're watching this between now and January 3rd, 2021, they're having a deal where by using the promo code ZACKSTAR, you'll get 25% off your yearly subscription. So that's a year of unlimited access to top documentaries in subjects ranging from math, to physics, to engineering, to history, and more for just $14.99. And with that, I'm going to end that video there. Thanks as always to my supporters on Patreon, Social media links to follow me are down below, and I'll see you guys in the next video.